you. At ServiceNow Knowledge 14 is sponsored by ServiceNow. Here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Frick. We're back. This is theCUBE. We're here at ServiceNow Knowledge 14, live at Moscone. We're in Moscone South. Stop by and see us. We're in the right-hand corner up by the escalators. Um, of course, here with, with Jeff Frick. We've been going, Jeff, uh, two days now, right? This is uh, we're midway through day two. We're here all the way through Thursday. We had Fred Luddy on this morning. We had uh, uh, Frank Slootman on yesterday. So we're sort of mirroring uh, the keynotes. And you know, Fred was just amazing. Bart Murphy is here, he's a CUBE alum, came on last year, we met him, he's like the busiest guy at this show. He's CIO and CTO of, of the CareWorks family of companies, and also the president of the CareWorks technology division, which we're going to talk about, relatively new initiatives there around ServiceNow. Bart, welcome back to theCUBE, good to see you again. Thank you, glad to be here. Yeah, so um, what do you think of the venue here at uh, San Francisco? Oh, I love the venue, I think, you know, the innovation sort of culture of this city uh, resonates well with this conference. Yeah, I thought Frank's uh, gold rush yeah. analogy up front was really good. This, uh, you can go a lot of directions there, right? There's, there's the history of the city. You know, ServiceNow is kind of a gold rush, right? A lot of investors made a lot of dough on uh, ServiceNow and probably more to come. And then, of course, you got IT organizations actually producing value after mm -hmm. you know decades and decades of cost cutting and maybe not decades. I mean, it's ebbed and flowed. But uh, So what's happening with uh, CareWorks, uh, give us an update mm -hmm. on both your role and sort of the new initiatives that you're working on. Sure, uh, so within CareWorks, uh, I mentioned before, four of them are really in the healthcare and the managed care space, and we've continued to just push uh, the ServiceNow platform and, and continue to look at opportunities to automate our business. Um, and really the investment that we've made in the last year from a ServiceNow platform perspective was just that, looking at it as a platform. So uh, looking at applications and ways to build processes and, and really identify use cases that we could decommission other types of systems uh, and put it into service now. And then also continue to expand our use of uh, the governance risk and compliance component to really manage our business. Uh, the audit activity has picked up. Uh, we have more companies doing more audits and uh, a lot of uh, the way that we've been able to manage that and continue to maintain uh, our sort of perfection, if you will, from an, uh, from an audit perspective was leveraging that platform and automating those controls. So you're, you're consolidating, even getting rid of some stuff in your portfolio, is that right? Yes, yeah, we've consolidated, uh, we've gotten rid of uh, redundant systems, but we've also then been able to look at our landscape of what I call all the Lotus Notes or the Access or the SharePoint, those type of components, and really make a decision architecturally to move those into service now and decommission those types of systems. It's all the homegrown stuff around those platforms that, yep. <clears throat> that never really were able to live up to the promise that they had, you know, in the case of Lotus Notes uh, decades ago, right? Yep. But um, how was the decision made to do that consolidation? Can you take us through sort of an example uh, as, to, uh, as to how the decision made and what, what role the ServiceNow platform plays? Well, I mean, part of the decision was made simply because uh, in many of these it's made for you, I'll give you an example. So uh, we had to deploy to Windows 7, which brings up a lot of issues with a lot of these systems that can't migrate when you're going into, let's say, Office 10 or Office 12 uh, environments. And that's when you find out from the business that they have these applications that are critical uh, that in reality, uh, nobody from IT was, uh, was really involved with, with the building of some of them. Uh, I'm not going to say all of them, some of them. And so when you look at that and, and look at what we need to do to, to create an actual better functioning system, uh, we look at how can we evaluate service now, deploy it into that infrastructure that we know is high performing. Uh, we know the development is uh, low cost uh, to do that development work and get out of uh, you know, the business of running these, these smaller types of apps and having to support them. Uh, so really from an architecture perspective, it's either my main ERP which is claims management, bill review, those type of things, or service now uh, is really what we look at. So you got, let's say, let's go through an example. So you got some apps, let's say, whether they're written in Lotus Notes or Excel or whatever it is. <clears throat> so when you, when you retire slash migrate those, what do you do? You, you, you develop an app in service now mm -hmm. with, with similar, comparable, or even greater functionality? How does, that, how does that work? Do you sort of replicate it and it's just the benefit of having it into the system, or do you sort of relook at the business requirements or both? 
both, uh, depending on really what the need is, mm -hmm. right? Uh, some of it is just a, a, a straight replace. Other times you have to rethink uh, what's the purpose. Uh, and in many cases, uh, as I mentioned last year, they had outsourced IT for one of the larger companies for quite some time. So those were built out of necessity because they couldn't get them accomplished uh, through their managed outsourced agreement. Um, so it just depends on, are they still applicable? Uh, does it make sense to either go into the core uh, ERP system or does it make sense to go into our core IT ERP system? Just one quick follow-up and I'll turn over to Jeff. But do you ever get the, look, it, it ain't broke, why fix it syndrome? Yeah, we do, but I try to educate the business on what technical debt means. And uh, you know, there's significant technical debt and skill sets that you need to continue to manage disparate platforms. And uh, you know, getting them to understand both on the infrastructure side what technical debt means and getting them to understand on the app side what technical debt means. All of that does is it, it really reduces your flexibility and your ability to innovate for the business. So mm -hmm. educating them on that and as to, you know, that alone to me to, to create a nimble environment where we can meet a business need in weeks, uh, days sometimes, because uh, we push to, to code production every two weeks uh, for our core systems. And that level of cadence we need to be freed up uh, from technical debt in order to focus on innovation. Powerful concept, you don't want technical debt on your balance sheet. No, I don't. Did, did they get it? I mean, did they, they did. When, when you sit down and actually work it through like that? Yeah, the, the, the business has been awesome. Uh, you know, we had a chance to rebuild the relationship between IT and the business as part of uh, the insourcing initiative, and it's been uh, it, an education on both sides. Uh, you know, I think IT understands a heck of a lot more about the business now. And I think the business understands a lot more about what our challenges were and, and what we need to do to ensure that we have platforms and capabilities that can meet what they need for uh, future enhancements and what they need to go attack a market. Yeah, now you're in a unique position and why we were joking that you're the busiest guy at, at, at Knowledge14, because you are both an internal service provider for a company like a lot of the CIOs here are, but you're also running a separate technology business that's mm -hmm. selling technology to other customers. So one of the conversations and themes that we've had going on over the last couple of days is the CIO's perspective, you know, they lead with a technical hat or do they lead with a business hat? Mm -hmm. You wear both. What, what can you say about how both of those roles have helped you in the other and what do you take back and forth uh, between those two roles? Well, I, I, you got to understand the business period. Um, the technical components help support a, t a strategy that you need to deploy, uh, and certainly having the capabilities uh, with a technology company helps, uh, but even when I look at trying to build the capabilities that I feel uh, could serve the market well, I have to first make sure that they would serve our companies well. Uh, so I get a little bit of benefit there because I get to prove through that process with my internal companies before potentially looking at a client problem or, or engaging uh, the external market. Uh, so that's you know a, a big benefit, but you can't lead with technology. Um, you got to lead with solving a problem. You got to lead with uh, you know some type of business case as it relates to improving their metrics, um, improving outcomes. And so uh, the technical component comes to where how good are you from a capability perspective to make that happen. Uh, and that's you know so a good example is we. Um, we, we, we do a lot of management of uh, infrastructure and IT for companies within that tech company. And one of the things that we wanted to do uh, to meet our clients' needs was to do real-time SLA reporting of our own services. Uh, so we use performance analytics within ServiceNow, and now our clients can get real-time SLA reporting versus you know a monthly report or other things that may have been part of the initial discussion contractually. So it solves a lot of business problems because there's ways to identify quickly whether we have issues either on the relationship side or on the value proposition side for the work we're performing. You know, those are those are valid concerns when you're doing a managed service uh, for a company. And the other thing we talked about off offline before we came on air is that you're going through a merger. Yeah. Um, and, and mergers are big IT events traditionally. Yes. So talk a little bit about um, how it's kind of a service now uh, and ERP only uh, focus are going to help you uh, execute the, the required tasks for this merger? Well, I think the biggest piece that we benefit from is our, our sort of, the way that we've built in GRC and the way we've built in our governance into our platform, because uh, it's very scalable. Uh, we, we started that with our MCO, we then scaled that out for the other companies, uh, and that model to prove to be real scalable. And now when we look at uh, you know the acquisition that we are acquired for, we're looking at how would that scale out to even a larger set of companies. We've already proved through the process. 
Uh, and the good thing is it allows you to move fast, but with the automation of the controls and the use of the ServiceNow platform, people don't or really aren't allowed to make mistakes uh, that could potentially impact us in the heat of an integration, right? So uh, we actually just completed the first integration uh, in six weeks. We got a company integrated into our environment. Um, and I think when you're working at that level of speed, you have to have platforms that are already built in. So all of our ITIL practices are built in. Uh, they're not just paper documents that people are following. They're actually automated controls within the system that help drive and influence that behavior. So from that perspective, we can ramp up people in a faster fashion without having significant organizational risk. Uh, and it allows us to really, really move fast. Okay, so CTO, technical, visionary, C CIO, uh, leader of the technology group, business liaison, you know, seat at the corporate table, president, you gotta worry about sales. Yes. Um, what's your favorite job? <laughs> you know, um, uh, leading, you know, uh, whether it's, um, you know, all those other things are great and, and, and they're certainly challenging, but I think leading people and leading IT people specifically to do better. Um, uh, I really push uh, the team members to be very poly-skilled, you know, and uh, we don't divide build and run. So I don't want to have, uh, you know, folks that feel they're too good for one type of work or not. Um, really, we're in it together to move the business forward. So leading people and changing the mindset of a lot of tech people uh, from being focused on technology and being more focused on customer service, whether that's the business, an external client, um, that's really the key, I think, to the future of IT. And if we don't do that, you know, we'll be outsourced or we'll be whatever the you know term is, you know, um, and we and we're not moving the business forward. So when we get to do that and we move the business forward, it's a good day. So we've heard a lot of talk at this conference about you know it's interesting. Last year was still a lot of problem management and change management oh. you know, as a starting point, and but we've really seen an acceleration of, of business value creation. One of the themes of Frank Slootman's presentation is the CIO needs to become a business leader. Absolutely. Um, and it's interesting, you're a good example of that. Uh, we had Atticus from Intuit on yesterday. He's you know, coming right out of the business. So if you're skeptical about that, as sometimes I am, there's real examples here at, at Knowledge of, of individuals that are CIOs that are actually you know, business leaders as well. Um, but, but the other piece of the messaging here is essentially taking you know, IT from a cost center to a, a business value creator. And in your case, with the, 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 the CareWorks technology side, it's a, it's a profit center? Is it that is, right? It, yeah. it's, it's, it's its own company, it's got its own P&L, uh, and it's a purely external consulting business. Uh, so we only get revenue and sales if people are willing to pay for our services. Uh, we uh, started a, a ServiceNow line of business last year uh, based on our capability and what we've built uh, within our family of companies internally. And we're now doing that work externally uh, from a ServiceNow perspective as well. We have an interactive line of business, uh, we have uh, infrastructure services, and then we have your typical IT consulting and staffing uh, component to that business. So, Amazon-like in that, you know, started to, they went to solve an internal problem and then they pointed it externally, mm -hmm. and you've done the same, I'm sure, on a much smaller scale. Um, Much and, smaller. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everybody's smaller than Amazon, exactly. except Google. <laughs> <laughs> so now, um, but but essentially, your role as CTO and CIO helps to sort of develop the product or the service in this case, and then you've extracted that or abstracted certain pieces of it, mm -hmm. and and now you're competing in the open marketplace. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah exactly. So, do you have a, 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 a presence here at the show? From we do. From we that actually, side. Yeah. Of the, so this is our first year uh, as an exhibitor. You got a booth at the show. Yeah. Right. We have a booth. You're at paying the show. away your way. All right. <laughs> yeah, That's yeah. awesome. And uh, <laughs> you know, we're 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 specific into our capabilities, uh, and we really look at it as a platform. I think. Even as a, as a, on the buy side, right, as a CIO and CTO, I felt even uh, the vendors uh, that were in the ServiceNow ecosystem were really pushing incident problem change and missing the whole concept of the ERP of IT. And uh, when I looked at it, I immediately gravitated towards the ERP of IT. Um, and so that's where I think there's an evolution on the, uh, on the consulting side. People are starting to understand uh, it's more than just a help desk system, and it, and that's the value proposition for this platform. I think you're really missing the boat if you simply do incident problem change and stop, uh, and don't look at your ecosystem within IT and figure out a way to uh, leverage the platform. You know, it's interesting. We're always talking about Nick Carr, 
Fred, oh, Fred Luddy mentioned him this morning. We, we, we sort of make, you know, poke fun at, at Nick, he, but he's very good and smart, um, even though he got it wrong. Uh, <laughs> but he's very successful mm -hmm. and, and quite bright. But we were talking to Jeffrey Moore about this yesterday. So what, what did he miss? And Jeffrey Moore said he missed uh, the, that he was focused on IT doesn't matter for systems of record. Um, that's really what he was talking about. And he sort of didn't think through the systems of engagement. So that was one piece. But what strikes me in talking to you, Bart, is that the other thing that he misses is what customers do with technology in post, you know, year 2000. What customers did with technology became much more important than what vendors did. So prior to, you know, Y2K, it was, it was monopolies of IBM and Microsoft and Intel and Cisco and EMC, all these great technologies that they're developing. And then you saw Google, Amazon, and then a much smaller example of guys like yourself. What you did internally with technology, and then you're able to point that externally and create value. That, it seems to me there's a renaissance going on with, with, with technology. Maybe you not even call it IT anymore, but it's technology-driven, data-driven organizations. Do you buy that? Yeah, not only data-driven, it's artistic. I think, you know, mm. uh, you know, just simply think it's just binary numbers and, and Xs and or zeros and ones. Uh, there's a, there's a creativity side that you have to infuse into your IT organization. Um, you got to make them think bigger. You got to make the business think bigger. Um, and I think that's, that's lacking and I think uh, no systems, machine, uh, internet of things will replace that component. Uh, and I think what you're seeing is you're seeing team companies that are nimble, uh, that don't have a significant amount of technical debt. They're able to address it. Uh, so that they can focus on those things. I think in many organizations, they're really good and they have really good IT, but they simply come in and solve problems every day and they're reoccurring problems. Uh, and that's where that maintenance dollar amount goes up and uh, they start to get marginalized by the business because they're going outside of them, whatever they call rogue IT, uh, which I just say is that's either you're, you have a relationship broken with your business or you have a very poor delivery system. If you have the business going outside of you as a leader of IT to try to find innovative technologies to help move their business forward. So if you can get that creativity and that type of stuff, I think uh, you'll have much better connected tissue with the business. And they'll be more willing, if you have a good delivery capability, to come in and allow you uh, the opportunity to show them what you can do. So the advantage you have is that you develop stuff internally, you can sort of eat your own dog food or drink your own champagne, yep. as folks like to say now, you can perfect it. I love that notion that you're using your own technology and then you can go out and, and sell it. But now let's talk about go to market. I mean, yeah. that's something that is not, I mean, you don't really usually have those discussions with CIOs and CTOs. You don't talk about go to market strategy. So mm -hmm. how did you make that transition? What is your go to market strategy with the, 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 the tech business? Talk about that a little bit. Uh, well, really the go to market strategy was around uh, our experience of leveraging as a platform and really around our governance and our interactive company. So when we look at even the vast number of, of great suppliers in the ecosystem for service now, we had to make sure that we differentiated our, differentiated our experience. Um, to me, incident problem change, these, all those, that's just a, a way we do work. Uh, and service now is the mechanism in which we do that are really what we're trying to do is bring that to the next level uh, by looking at uh, the ways to automate and governance, to, to look at it as an entire system, uh, an ERP for IT and get companies, and we've had a lot of companies that have engaged us where they may have done an uh, initial implementation, stood it up, and that's where they stopped. Uh, the other big area that we're looking at is um, leveraging our interactive and design capabilities and building way better portals. Uh, so when you look at even yesterday during Frank's uh, 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 session, they had a few customer portals up there, right? And, and there was a few good designs. I think there's a whole consumerization and engagement model that's missing. Uh, and you have to find a way to get people to engage more on the platform, and then that will bring in more use cases to the platform. So to do that, users, especially non-IT users, want to get that, that sort of custom experience. They want it to be branded very similar from a marketing perspective as their corporate components. So, you know, with that usability uh, practice and that interactive and marrying it in with the CMS on ServiceNow is another sort of go-to-market strategy that we have because we're unique in that space. There's very few uh, folks that have both the interactive 
in the engineering background uh, to do that on the ServiceNow platform. Yeah, and you're really seeing the ecosystem start to, to come alive here, and that's a, that's a sign of a healthy company and a healthy ecosystem when, when, the, when the partners start making money, because it's all about making money at the end of the day, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and solving problems, of course, but when you go to a Proving show like IT, this, yeah. right? When you're talking about you know, partners, they, they got to get margin and, but, and but make But what money. an interesting concept, though, to use the delivery as a demand gen for yeah. your own internal service. I mean, we don't hear that very often. We hear about people making nice customized portals and, and, and really kind of packaging their services as products, but you're really thinking it through to the next level about, I loved your, I loved your word, connected tissue, to make sure that you are connected and getting more connected with the business users by delivering what they want, and then that, that turns around and drives your demand Exactly. Uh, so you can buy more stuff and get more people and deliver more value. Exactly, and, and the faster you can do that pace, you're going to end up outworking most people. Uh, and so they do say work harder, uh, smarter, not harder. I think I do both. And I think by uh, working hard on the engineering disciplines within your organization, whether that's automation on the agile side, uh, whether it's you know good coding standards, whether it's uh, shorter sprints, uh, and all the discipline that requires on the build side. You have to look at the engineering discipline in order to improve that velocity. You start to improve that velocity, you start to have different conversations with the business. Uh, there's things that they didn't even have time to think about that now they do. Uh, so that's what we try to push. I want to have just better IT. I think IT's gotten a bad rap for quite some time uh, and uh, we just need to do a, a much better job of moving our businesses forward. Every company is a tech company and that's just the way it's going to be. So if you know that, you have to make sure that you can move that tech forward. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the technology division. Um, what do you actually sell? Are you selling consulting? Are you selling implementation, management, we've, design? We've done it all. So we sell the implementation, so the implementation uh, of ServiceNow, uh, and we'll work through whatever wave function and, and recommend sort of maybe the path in which uh, they want to implement certain modules to meet certain business uh, issues. Uh, we do the CMS, uh, we do a lot of work around uh, governance and risk and compliance and trying to marry in audit. I, I, I always laugh, there's not an IT team that I've gone to from a client side where they have uh, much good words to say about IT audit or audit in general. <laughs> and uh, in our organization, we're one. I mean, there is no disconnect, there is no animosity. Uh, and I think, you know, look, at, we use the platform to help facilitate that relationship, right? Uh, just like we've been able to help facilitate the relationship with the business by removing our technical debt and improving our innovation. So if you can use a platform like ServiceNow to help bridge the gap and, and maybe mend some, some pretty uh, bad relationships between your audit and your IT, uh, that's another good opportunity that a lot of organizations are looking at. So how do you compete with the big whales? You know, I'm thinking Accenture, Ernie Young, you know, Deloitte, mm -hmm. you know, Cloud Sherpas. And how do you compete with those guys? Uh, speed. Uh, I think that uh, you know when we engage in the type of work that we do, uh, one, we bring that same level of, of, of breakdown of work and short sprints uh, to our service now work, the same thing we do on our interactive. I mean, on our interactive, we could build a new brand. I think we did one in eight weeks and launched it. Um, and that's our value proposition on that side, uh, especially when you're working like in the e-commerce space. It's a lot around speed. And I think that uh, you know speed, and I'm not reducing, no re reduction in quality. But I think speed is something that a lot of the larger organizations just, they can't do. Uh, and so uh, that's really one of our value propositions is the speed at which we can get that done, implemented, and operational. And, and your practice is primarily focused on service now, or is that just one line of business? That's one line of business underneath tech. We have four, uh, so we have a standalone interactive uh, called CWT Interactive. We have a, an infrastructure services division, which does the managed services for companies and we have, um, it's called IT automation and governance. Uh, that's really why we call that uh, line of business for service now, is really it's around IT automation and governance. So when you create that automation, don't lose sight of your governance uh, and, and drive a lot of automation from your governance requirements. Uh, so it's leveraging the ServiceNow platform, but it's called that for a specific reason. Uh, it's really looking at your IT operational stack and determining how can I automate? How can I reduce uh, the mundane tasks that people don't want to do? How do I elevate a tier one to really be working on tier two work? And then that means my tier two moves to tier three. My tier three now can be looking at strategic initiatives. So just trying to up the game of everybody within the IT. And then we have a, a staffing line of business as well where we work with uh, large organizations and 
make sure that we provide them with uh, the appropriate types as of resources. As an augmentation. As an augmentation component. So can you, uh, can you talk, share with us you know, the, the size of the business, even if it's head count, I don't know if you divulged. Uh, sure, I can give you a head count, I can't talk about the revenue, um, but we're about 220 uh, consultants uh, within our CareWorks uh, tech line of business. Okay, so it's pretty substantial. And, yes, and you operate primarily in the U.S. or exclusively in the U.S.? Exclusively in the U.S., uh, mostly in the, the Midwest region. We do have clients in different parts, and now uh, with uh, the uh, acquisition from York, uh, when they acquired us, they have presence all over the, uh, the United States, so uh, that's starting to uh, bring up demand for our services as well, and it was one of the, actually the differentiators, I think, when they talked to us, is uh, they like the fact that we had a technology company that they can now leverage for their internal companies as well and eliminate uh, sort of the need to go out to different providers uh, for the services that we provide. So the plan is to now take this um, across the, uh, well, nationally, mm -hmm. right? And then globally as well, or do you envision that? Or uh, you know, we've had, uh, it's funny, we've talked to some folks that reached out to us from Canada for GRC, things like that. Uh, no plans currently, mm -hmm. I think there's enough critical mass, if you will, for me to focus on within uh, the U.S. <laughs> and even in Ohio alone, uh, with the number of companies that are there and the number of companies that have adopted service now, um, this is a long road. Just like any ERP system, you have to continue to invest and, and innovate on the platform in order to get the business value. It's not something you let sit uh, and, and just say, good enough is good enough. You can certainly do that, uh, but I don't think that you're going to keep getting the efficiencies that you need to have in order to move the business forward. So your objective is what? Steady growth, profitable growth? Yep, so um, I, I, profitable growth, steady growth. Uh, the one thing I'm very cautious about is, you know, the people we hire, I want to have very good engineering backgrounds, uh, very good skill sets. Um, uh, you know, I think you've got to be very technical but also understand the business. So we really limit our growth uh, from the standpoint of the resources that we can bring in and train. Uh, and then, you know, I'm sure at some point we may look at a larger growth strategy, but we're growing, you know, uh, uh, at a very good pace uh, with that strategy in place right now. Yeah, I mean, scaling the, the a services business like that is not trivial, right? I mean, mm. you've, you've got the, the distribution channel and you've got the expertise and you've got the back end and, mm. you know, you got to deliver and it's, you know. You got to deliver. Yeah. That's <laughs> the key. So, you know, it, 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 growth without, uh, you know, with having delivery issues is not something that I think is a, is a good thing for us to do. So, the focus is on delivery uh, and then we'll grow based on our ability to grow that delivery engine and make sure that we can you know, hit our projects. That's the goal. How about um, things that you want to see from ServiceNow? What's, what's on their to-do list? We talked about this a little last year yeah. and I thought you had you know, good perspectives on it. Um, where, where do you want to see them focus? Well, you know, like I mentioned, we did the performance analytics. So I think executive dashboarding and those type of components, which they've shown some stuff here that I've been impressed with. Mm -hmm. But just getting a, a better uh, a management view into the system, because again, that will drive some of my demand as far as what the, uh, the management team wants to see in the application uh, in service now. So I think there's some growth there still. They did do the acquisition of Mira 42 last year, which right. is now what they call performance analytics. Um, so it, it could be just that we need to get more familiar with the platform, but I want to see you know, some more growth in that area. Um, on the CMS side, I think there, there's some work, not from the standpoint of their own UI, but the ability to influence that UI without maybe touching and impacting all of ServiceNow uh, as you know every table. If I want the table to look different, for instance, in an internal page, I don't want to have to change the entire style mm -hmm. of all of ServiceNow for all my internal users. So trying to figure out a way of how, you know, how much more flexibility can they give us on a CMS side so that we can, when it's being, whether it's an, an external customer, consumer, or an internal person, really they don't even know it's service now. It's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a brand, uh, you know, it's consistent with their brand, it's consistent with their usability uh, requirements, and uh, it's less of looking like ServiceNow. Right. It begs the question, how do you interface with ServiceNow to get that information back to them? Uh, we work a lot with ServiceNow on the different teams. Uh, my, uh, my head of compliance works with them a lot on GRC. Uh, they're gracious enough to, you know, let us go and talk to them on, on different parts of the platform. Um, and uh, so we work a lot on, you know, the new releases as they go out uh, for general lease and stuff like that. So. We have a couple different avenues, and they've been very, very gracious to help offer up, you know, when they can, what type of features are coming, uh, what type of enhancements are coming, 
uh, so that I hopefully don't spend the time custom developing that, right? And uh, only to be replaced by feature and service now. All right, Bart, we're going to leave it there. Thank you very much for, for coming on. The, the new business executive, CIO, CTO, President, P&L manager, sales guy. Yep. Yeah, well done. No, thank Congratulations you. on all your success and, pleasure. and good luck going Thanks forward. For coming on. All right, everybody, keep it right there. We'll be right back. Uh, we're live from ServiceNow in Moscone in San Francisco. This is theCUBE.